was taking place in these false religious groups around the church. And so specifically, they are going to mention in this God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, specifically to combat that false teaching that was going into the church. And so today I want to look at what it means to say, I believe in God, because that's really not that shocking of a statement, right? To say, I believe in God really does not do much in this society. In fact, just as recent as two years ago, Pew Research did a study in America, and it found nine out of 10 Americans believe there is a God, a supreme being somewhere out there in the universe, right? Nine out of 10 people would say that they believe that. So when we confess that we believe in a God, that is wildly insufficient to define what we mean or to claim to be a follower of him. We are really good as people of kind of forcing our own picture of what we want God to be like. So we kind of fabricate these ideas. We see people, nine out of 10, believing there's a God. And so coming up with many different versions as uh Carl is sharing here, baptizing themselves into the Ganges River, believing it has the uh, spirit of a God there and having some kind of healing power. So the people doing that believe in a God too and wouldn't find themselves separate from us in that. So we have to look and see what we mean specifically. And the truth is, I think there's some flaws here in the Pew Research study. I think the problem is it says nine out of 10 Americans believe that there is a God I would argue the truth is, deep down inside, 10 out of 10 Americans and 10 out of 10 Canadians and 10 out of 10 Indians would believe there is a superior, supreme being in the universe. And the reason I make that claim is from Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, Paul writes out here um, about God's wrath being poured out against all the godliness and unrighteousness of people because they suppress the truth since what can be known about God is evident among them, because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what was made. And as a result, people are without excuse. For they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and senseless, their hearts were darkened, Claiming to be wise, they're actually fools. So people deep down inside know there is something bigger than us out there. And yet when we say we believe in God, we have to be very clear about defining what we mean about that. The other problem is people will say, yeah, I believe there is a God, right? And so we hear a lot of people because we um, don't want to be mean, right? A lot of people in society will say, well, yeah, but you know, you're taking kind of that path to God, and this person's kind of taking that path. And as long as you're pretty genuine about what you believe, um, then yeah, you're going to get there some way, right? Um, you're going you're gonna to find a way, whether it's through Islam or Christianity or just your own spirituality. Um, you believe there is a God. However, when we say, I believe in God, we're not talking about this vague concept of a supreme being, and we're not talking about a host of different little gods that could be that. This quote here uh, that expresses this idea comes from, there was a, a quote in time from a film producer named Marty Kaplan, and he uh, was Jewish, and then he converted to atheism, and then back to a form of Judaism again. And here is his quote that summarizes the issue that we have to look at here this morning. He says, The God I have found in common to Moses and Muhammad, to Buddha and Jesus, it is known to every mystic tradition. In mine, it is the Tetragrammaton. That's the five letters that spell God's name in Judaism. The name so holy that those who know it dare not say it. It is what the Kabbalah calls ayin, nothingness, no thingness. It is spirit being the all. I used to think of psychic phenomena as new age flim flam. I used to think of reincarnation as a myth. I used to think uh, that all this was a metaphor. Now I know there is a God, my God, in here, demanding not faith, but experience. 
an inexhaustible wonder at the richness of this very moment. In case you didn't catch that, he's saying, eh, they're all kind of the same. Whatever your experience is that takes you whichever down any route, it's all the same supreme being. We're just getting there in different ways. And what's scary is we expect this from the world, right? That, that makes sense. If you are not a follower of Christ and you don't understand the truth of Scripture, uh, it, it would make sense that you would be confused, dead in your sin and your blindness. And what's scary to me is that a survey done just this year in 2020, the state of theology put out by Ligonier Ministries found that 63% of all Americans, so about six out of 10 Americans, would affirm the statement saying, yes, this is true. God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. So the all paths lead to the same God kind of comment. Now here is what is frightening and discouraging to me. Half of evangelical Christians, people identifying as evangelicals, half of them agreed with this statement. 41% strongly agreed with it. 9% said they were kind of on the fence, but leaning in that direction. So half of people sitting in church this morning across the country would tell you that the Muslim in a mosque is worshiping the same God that we are worshiping. There is something very scary about that. And if you guys leave here thinking that, then fire me. Um, because um, I would deserve more damnation than that for letting that idea be believed by you here in these seats. So what do we do about this? And what do we look at here? Well, without God's revelation about himself, we are not clever enough or smart enough or alive enough to be able to understand anything about God. So how does God reveal himself to us specifically in his word? And that itself could be like a year-long series, right? We could go through all that, So I prayed and I prayed about it, and specifically even using this quote about God's name from Marty Kaplan, it made me think, if we are clarifying the God that we say we believe in, how does he introduce himself to us? So the first time that you meet someone, right? So Carl and Joanna had the privilege of meeting you for the first time, right? We walk up to each other and I say what? I say, hi, my name is Paul. We got to talk on the phone the other day and you say, oh yeah, hey, I'm Carl. Uh, This is my wife, Joanne, right? The first thing we do when we meet someone is we tell them our, we tell them our name. So let's take a look at where God reveals his name in scripture and what that tells us about being specific about the God that we are serving and we are worshiping. In the context of this, to, um, to zoom in here is that um, some of you may be very familiar with this story, some of you others not, but the SparkNotes version is uh, Moses is hiding out with his wife and father-in-law, and he's tending to his sheep. And so he's out, and he's out Mount Horeb, and he sees this bush that is on fire, but not on fire. It's, there's a fire in the bush, but the bush is not burning up. Um, and as a pyromaniac, I can tell you that's not a common experience um, when you burn something. And so he goes over And it's like, hey, what's going on with this crazy bush? When all of a sudden, God speaks to him. And so he goes there and he says, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. And Moses says, okay, but you know, who who are you, Mr. Fire? And God says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he realized what he's walked into here in this situation. God explains that he is aware of what's happening to the Israelites in Egypt as slaves, and it is time to free them from that slavery. He says, guess what, Moses? You're the man for the job. You're going to go back to Egypt, where you were raised, the royal family, who you were hiding from after killing a guy. It was a slave guy, so that's like only half a murder. Um, so after going there, we want you to go and tell them to let my people go. And so of course, Moses answers the way probably any of us would, what, uh, who am I that I am going to do this? And God proceeds to explain to him that it doesn't matter who Moses is. God has chosen him for this job and will be with him. And he says, okay, fine, I'll do it. But 
look, when I go to the Israelites, you know, um, I'm not sure they'll really believe that I'm with them um, because I was living, you know, in the royal palace. Um, what am I supposed to say to them? Who do I say sent me? And then God answers. And this is our passage for this morning. Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. And honestly, uh, one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. Um, I have two tattoos, and one of them is God's name from this passage. If that tells you how much I love this passage. So God answers. God replies to Moses and says, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am sent you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, I am, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. So guess what? We're one of those generations that God has said, this is how he is to be remembered. So let's take a look here at the text specifically. See what it is telling us about God, about his name that he has chosen to reveal to us, and then how that applies to us when we're leaving here this afternoon. So he comes here, and God replies to him. And I want to just point out a couple of my vocab words here, because the richness of this truly comes in God revealing his name. And so the text begins out saying that God replied to Moses. They use the word Elohim. Some of you may be familiar with that, being in church, and that is literally just the word for gods. It is the generic term that they would use about any god in any religion. It's pretty similar to the way we use God in English. If I say, I believe in God, I'm meaning the God of Scripture, and I say, oh, well, Muslims also believe in a god, right? It is a generic term used for everyone. And so we find Moses getting more information about who this God is, who this divine being is that's answering him. And his answer is, I am who I am. He says, I am. Um, And this always sounds made up when I read it, but the Hebrew word is haya, just like, you know, a karate chop. And I'm sorry, but I think that every time it's haya, which is the word in Hebrew meaning to be, to exist, to happen. And for my word nerds, it is in the imperfect tense. And for people who are not word nerds, you're like, okay, why do I care that it's in the imperfect tense? The beauty of it being in the imperfect tense means it's an ongoing action that has been happening, is happening, and will be happening. And the great thing is, is in the Hebrew, um, they don't have the same Uh, type of structure around their words as the Greek does or in English it does. And so this form here um, does not specify at what point in time this is happening. In other words, it means that it was and it is and it will be happening indefinitely unless something changes. It is, in English, a word ending in I-N-G. When I tell Reagan how to translate the imperfect, I say, Put ing at the end of a word. So I am walking. I am running. Probably not going to see that. I am walking. I'm eating. I'm doing this, right? Ing. It's ongoing. And so he says, haya asher, which asher, that middle word means which, that, because, who. So depending on which version of the English Bible you're using, you're going to get some different choices of how to describe that word in there. You might see in your Bible, it says, I am who I am. I am that I am, I am which I am, but we got to look at the use of this word in its sense to understand the beauty that it means all of these things all at once and what he's saying his name is. And so I like the last choice of it, because, and we see that God is revealing himself saying, my name, Moses, is I am because I am, meaning I always have been because I am. I am right now because I am. And I always will be because I am. This is God's name. I am because I am. And then what I love about God identifying himself in this too is 
the very first word in this passage was Elohim. And Elohim answers that his name in Hebrew is uh, Yahweh, which is the simple form of, of the Hayah word. Just trust me on that. I'll save a lot of time. And so by doing that, it's clarifying, despite what some people might say, there are not two gods present in Israelite literature. There is one God. They are clarifying when they say Elohim, they mean Yahweh. When we say God here in church, we mean Yahweh. It's very specific about what we mean and who we worship. It's the uh, square rectangle situation, right? So a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle isn't always a square. So when I say God, it can be the Lord Jesus Christ, who is Yahweh, who is the Holy Spirit. Um, but also I could be referring to a fake God. But here we have the one true God, and there is clarity in this. And digging just a little bit deeper, sorry, because the more excited I am, the, the more academic or nerdy it becomes. What we have here is very specific. There are no other uses of the name Yahweh found anywhere in the ancient Near East. The term Elohim, or whatever form it would take in a different language, is all throughout the ancient Near East. The name Baal is all throughout the ancient Near East. Yahweh is specifically used for Israel's God, showing that he specifically is who he is, and he is not this uh, uh, hard-to-see being that we can reach through worshiping Baal, that we can reach through worshiping Allah, we can reach through being a good person and trying our best, Right? He is specifically who he is here, and then revealing himself in the flesh as Jesus Christ. And what's interesting about this is, why does Moses ask what name he is supposed to give Israel? I would guess, this is my speculation is, the name is not used in other contexts, right? And Marty Kaplan, our uh, Jewish to atheist to Jewish guy, Mention in the thing, and a lot of you probably are familiar with this, that uh, Orthodox Jews still today will not use the name of God out loud. They won't even write it. If they do write it, they have to fold up the paper and burn it when they're done with the piece of paper because it is so holy, they tremble when thinking about how incredible it is to know God's name. And to know someone's name then had power. And so it meant we admit we have no power over God, and so we are humbly not saying this out loud. Even when it's written in the text, they use the word Lord in place of it to respect and show proper respect and reverence for God being the ultimate almighty. So, fun fact in English, whenever you see Lord in all capitals, it's because it says Yahweh in the Hebrew, and they're doing that out of respect. For God. So if they are not saying this name, if they're not writing this name, except for when Moses writes down scripture after this takes place, do you think someone outside of Judaism would have known the name Yahweh? When Moses shows up and tells them, he told me his name is I am because I am, that would mean something to the Jewish people about a specific name for God. This guy wasn't making this up. This is a verification that he is the messenger that God has sent. And then God adds, saying, this is what you are to tell them. Tell them, I am, has sent me to you. I am the Lord. I am, I am. The God of your ancestors. Remember, this is the God that Abraham worshipped. This is the God that Isaac worshipped. This is the God that Jacob worshipped. And just little old me, Moses, little old me, Moses at the time, this is the guy that sent me to you. And God says, this is my name forever. And this is how I am to be remembered in every generation. That word remembered, meaning, only one meaning, recognition for past meritorious deeds. In other words, my name, when you use it, is a reminder of all the mighty things that I have done. So every time they use that name, every generation should look back and remember what God has done throughout scriptures and what God has done in your life. The mere fact that any of us here 
are worshiping him is a miracle, a mighty act of God to save such an unworthy person like myself or truthfully like you. So what do we see in this specific name of God? What do we learn that separates us from all other paths that claim to have a way to a supreme being? And so the one specific attribute that I whittled this down to here to make a bite-sized piece is the one that just stands out screaming at us as the main point of this text. And that is the fancy word, it's God's aseity, all right? Aseity, it's Latin and it comes from, from self. It's God's from selfness. That is what is screaming at us when we look at this passage. And so there's all these fancy definitions that we could read and spend all day digesting and trying to take apart. But the real quick one that I like hits the point. It says from the Lexham uh, Survey of Theology, this means that God's existence is not caused by or in any way dependent on anything else. God is not from anything, through anything, or to anything. Rather, quoting Romans eleven thirty six, from him and through him and to him are all things. So God is. I really like um, this phrase here that's used by Durham in one of these things. He says, what's revealed to us in this passage is, we'll put this in quotation marks because it's not a real word yet, it is God's isness, I S hyphen N E S S. His isness, yes, um, yes. That might sound like, uh, but yeah. So his isness, and so his isness is actual and intense. Um, it means that he is in every place at every point of time in every circumstance or need. He is. He is his isness. And it's interesting, Titus, I guess, is really starting to grasp this concept. I told some of you, like he, I think I mentioned the other week, we were driving, and he's like, Dad, you know, so can God, can Jesus see us right now? And I was like, yeah. He's like, whoa, Jesus is kind of a creeper. Um, I don't know, it's the first time I ever heard that. I said, well, no, he, he has the right to know what's going on. Don't you understand how reassuring this is, Titus? And he brought this up again just last night going to sleep. So I, I had this like cut um, on my arm and he decided that getting into bed, he needed to jump on top of it. Um, and I was like, ah! I was like, sorry, man, you, just, you, know, you jumped right on that, on uh, my boo-boo. Um, and it hurt. And he goes, does Jesus know you have a boo-boo right now? And I was like, yeah, he's here. What? <laughs> he's here right now? Yeah. Well, is he looking at us? Uh, probably. Is he looking at anybody else? Uh, yeah, everybody. That's weird, Dad. <laughs> I said, you're right. It is pretty weird um, for us to understand. And honestly, our understanding of it, buddy, doesn't really go beyond what you've just understood. He is, and he is here, and he's all present and all knowing. And um, I reassured him that God knew I had a cut on my arm and that it would be okay. Um, and that it isn't creepy. I said, just think about the fact that no matter what happens tonight, God is here with you. Like, shouldn't that be reassuring? Um, I said, that also means when you're rude to your mom and I'm at work, God is there with you and he knows what you're doing. Um, so God is. And if a four-year-old can get it, maybe choosing some less than honoring theological terms like creeper, um, <laughs> He is, he is present and he is here and he is and there's nothing else to say, but he is isness in every place at every time. The presence of God is not this living uh, universal force, this impersonal being, something that is not out there. God's isness is vital and necessary to our very existence and self. Like we sang, it's your breath in my lungs. What right do I have to use that for anything but glorifying God? in what I say. And never is God's isness just some uh, ornamental decoration. It's not the nice little figurine that we put on a shelf, and it's nice to know it's there in every situation, in every year, in every day, in every time, in every place. God's presence is the active ingredients of the universe's very existence. 
And his isness is demonstrated here in this passage. I myself, as someone who grew up in church, sometimes take this story for granted. And I would suspect a lot of you who have been in church for a while take the idea of the burning bush, and we, uh, we've seen the Prince of Egypt or the Ten Commandments, or we have the picture Bible for our kids. We see depictions of someone drawing. We got the bush with the flame on it, right? And, oh, that's cool. It's not burning up. That's a miracle. Um, what a great thing. Think about it. So in this very instance, God chooses how to reveal himself to Moses. Throughout scripture, God appears in the form of a person when he shows up. We see Christ in the Old Testament before they go to fight the battle of Jericho. He shows up looking like the commander of an army and says, I'm here to take over. I'm for me. We see when he comes to Gideon and talks to him, what does he look like? He looks like a person. He shows up at Abraham's house for lunch and has lunch with him as a person. So why doesn't he just show up in the form of a person to speak to Moses? Why does he use a burning bush that doesn't burn? I would argue it in itself describes to us this isness. I mentioned the pyromanacy in my backyard. Um, always burning things when I get a chance. And when you burn stuff, it disappears because the fire needs fuel to keep burning. Sometimes it needs some extra gasoline too. But this fire needs no fuel. It is on this scraggly little bush that should be burned up to a crisp. And yet as Moses is looking at God, there is a fire that is fueling itself. It exists because it exists, not because anything is fueling it. And so why he is seeing this phenomenon and trying to imagine what is going on, God reveals, I am because I am. The fire that burns because the fire burns. The God who exists because he exists. And that is what that fancy word is saying. He is telling us about God. Now, at some point, the uh, opposition would say this doesn't make any sense. How can something be just because it be? How can something have isness? And uh, the 19th century uh, British philosopher, Bertrand Russell, wrote a book called Why I'm Not a Christian. So this should give us some insight onto why he's not a Christian. And the reason that he gives is because... After studying utilitarians like um, different philosophers, he comes up to the conclusion that every cause has to have an effect. And so, how can there be anything if there isn't first a cause? And he's partially right. If anybody has had a toddler, you will know that a lot of the conversations just have the word why in them. So, what are you doing? Uh, I'm grilling hamburgers. Why? Uh, because I'm hungry. Why? Because uh, my body burned off these things and I got to refuel. Why? Because uh, that's the way God made us. Why? And that's the great thing about being a Christian. You get to just tell your kid, because that's what he wanted to do. And we're done with the conversation, right? But when we think about it, we ask the same question. So uh, Russell, just like many great minds sitting here this morning, we have to think through, why do I exist? Why, 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 why? And whatever we come back to on existence and what we'll look at next week is we see that we're talking about God, the Father, and the Creator. At some point, something had to happen to make this universe exist. And so if you have Stephen Hawking saying it's the Big Bang, and you ask him, well, what caused the material before the Big Bang? He says, that doesn't matter. When we look at God and we say, really honestly, for a second, take our bias off and say, well, God created the matter and God formed it, right? And then we say, well, okay, we got you on the, where did the matter come from? And they say back to us, well, we got you because where did God come from? It's the same argument. However, if we go back, there's one important flaw in Russell's statement. He's assuming that God is an effect. And if God is an effect of something, then yeah, he has to have a cause. That is the way he has ordered the universe. However, no matter what philosophy you're pushing, what religion you're pushing, what acid trip you're pushing, 
there has to be an answer at some point in time of what is the primary cause of the first effect. And the answer to that is I am, because I am. He's always, and he's not an effect. He's the primary cause. And so that's not a weak leg to stand on, as some would position. Everyone has to admit at some point, something had to be a primary cause. And again, nine out of 10 Americans will admit they believe that. And scripture tells us 10 out of 10 people on the planet know deep down inside that is true. So what does that do for us? I would just be excited talking for an hour about God's isness um, and how he is and using different forms of the word be and is and uh, being, having my mind blown by this. But in the same type of conversation I had with Titus last night laying in bed, what does it mean that God is? So what that means is that the God who is has told us he is with us. So when he says, I am, that could just mean that he's everywhere. He's always existing, right? He's there, he's watching, stinks for you, good for you, and has no active role in creating and maintaining this universe that he has designed. And so I made up the word. Um, I, it's not one of the omnis you'd find in a, in, a, in a systematic theology book, but we have a God who is, and he's not just omnipresent, omniscient, I can't pronounce words this morning, all-knowing, all-powerful. He is omni-competent. What I mean is he is all-competent. He is all-able. He is in every way, shape, or form exactly what we need right now, and he was for Moses then, and he will be for our great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren far down in the future he is. And so when we leave here, I want us to remember God's answer when people ask the question, who are you? And his answer is, I am because I am. So even here in Exodus chapter 3, right before our verse, I said, Moses asked God, who am I that you're going to send me to Pharaoh of the world's greatest superpower and tell him to let his slave force go free? God's answer had nothing to do with Moses. He didn't say, well, you know, if you think about it, I helped you out with the whole basket baby thing. You didn't get eaten by a crocodile. And then, you know, the princess found you and then you were raised there. And so you got kind of this relationship already. It's pre-existing. You got a foot in the door. So I thought really, no, his answer is, I will be with you. It's not Moses. I thought you were the best man for this job. In fact, Moses argues he's a poor speaker and he comes with every excuse in the book. God's answer to who am I to do this task is, I'll be with you. So just go do it because I will be there and I am there and I always will be there. I am the one that will be there. And so the answer is that God is present and he will be with him exactly in every way, shape, or form that Moses is inadequate to handle this task, God is adequate and omnicompetent. As unsuited in every flaw I have, God is the one that moves in people as we study his word. And he's promised Moses here, I am with you. And what that reminds me of is here we have Christ in his last statement before ascending to heaven. And I loved, so uh, Carl mentioned the Great Commission this morning, right? He gives us our command in the same way that he's told Moses, here's your job, Moses. This is what you're going to do. And when you freak out about it because you are inadequate, I'm with you. And he says to us, hey, go out and make disciples of every nation, Go and make disciples of the whole world. And then his last statement in Matthew 28, 20, the second half of the verse is, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And this I am isn't a careless word written down here in scripture. 
Throughout his ministry, Jesus identifies himself when asked as, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Before Abraham, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John 8, when the Pharisees and the people are questioning him and saying, who are you? He tells them, well, I already told you who I am. And they push and they push. And his answer to him in chapter 8 is that I've told you all these so many things, and yet they didn't get it. So Jesus says to them in verse 29, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know I am He. And so Christ is telling us here that He is one with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, and He is I am. It is Christ who is in the burning bush sending Moses to go do this, and it's Christ who's sending us out into the world to serve Him, whether through international missionary work whether through hosting a fair trade sale, whether through, uh, I don't know, dragging people in from the dental office into church, through these conversations we're having with our neighbors and everyone else and discipleship groups. How is any of that accomplished? Because I am, is, and he is with us. And so we see here that it is because God is and because Christ is and lived a perfect life, fully God and fully man, And when we lifted him up on the cross to pay the penalty of sin, we now could see that he is, I am because I am. Paying the penalty of sin and then rising from the grave and ascending and he's seated on the throne. And listen, if if you have faith in that, then this promise is for you today that God is, his isness is. I was just going to rhyme. That's cheesy, but I'm going to do it. His isness is in your business. And, um, and so he is with you. And if you are not a follower of Christ, whether you're here, you're watching online, we've got the number on there. We'd love to pray with you after the service so that you can understand what it means to follow Christ. And so as we look at this, this omnicompetent, self-existing God leaves us with not much to really be afraid of, huh? And so uh, I, I end here with, this concept presented. So in, it's actually a commentary on Acts chapter 7, which is some persecution in the church, right? And so in Calvin's commentary on that, he mentions the fact that the church is in a constant state of the fire of persecution. And yet, reminding us that Jesus promised in Matthew sixteen eighteen that the church will be sustained by the presence of God. And God will keep the universal church from being consumed into ashes. And so that isness of God, I am because I am, means that when we face persecution, and although for us here in the States, we've had this very nice blip in the timeline of humanity of, uh, yeah, wearing a mask and not being able to come for a month is not persecution. Um, We have... I'm sure if you want it, Carl and Joanne could share a few stories about persecution. We have brothers and sisters across the globe losing their lives today, losing their kids, losing their loved ones. And yet, despite being burned, the church is not consumed into ash. And so one day when persecution comes for us, or when it comes to India, or when it's with our brothers and sisters across the globe, the very fact that God is self-existent mean just like the fire that is, but does not consume the bush, nothing will consume the church. Why? Because God is with a period after it. And so as we leave, I want you to ask yourself that thing that God's been putting on your heart to do for him, the task that you have set out before you this week, the job you have to go to tomorrow morning, the conversations that just kind of come up, and you ask, who am I to do this? I'm just so-and-so. The answer is not that you have all this training or you've been in church long enough or there was such a compelling sermon the day before at church. The answer to who are you to do what God is putting on your heart, to share the gospel with the people around you, to serve 
the people around you. Who are you to do that? Who are the Vinaroths to serve people in India? They don't have any superpowers. Who are they? Who am I? Who are you? The answer has nothing to do with us. It is because God is. And so I stand here this morning and say, I believe in Yahweh, the God that is because he is. You pray with me here? Father God, thank you for uh, today. Thank you that you, even though you absolutely could have every right to conceal yourself from us, have chosen to give us your name so that when we seek for you, you, you make it clear who you are. And so I ask, Lord, that you would remind your people today and this week and the month and, and the years and decades to come that we'll remember you are because you are and remember what you have done in every generation. I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would empower us to stop asking and thinking through all of our inadequacies, but to rather just surrender to the fact that you are because you are, and that no matter what we're doing, I pray, Lord, that you would remind us that you are there and you are all competent, all capable, and you promised you will always be with us. And I ask for anyone who's not following you, Lord, that you would give them ears to hear this gospel that we all are so undeserving of your grace, and yet you offer it here to us. I pray that you would open their hearts to follow you and that they would be able to experience the richness that is your self-existence. In Jesus' name, amen.